we're going to start with a demonstration of two of our robots down here, one of the aerial robots, which is a powered drone, which you can buy from Amazon for about £270, £280. We just recently purchased uh, nine more of these because they do fall out the sky, so don't be alarmed. Uh, and it's going to track, uh, autonomously track the robot in front. And Alan is going to uh, start us off and uh, pilot drone to take off. So it all worked earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so what the robot has done, it's uh, the camera underneath which is acquired the target on the on the little I-90 it's called down there. <coughs> and the flying robot now is actually uh, autonomously controlling itself. And so it's updating both positions relative to the robot underneath. This gives you a simple demonstration of um, a little bit of image processing. So we're recognizing the target and tracking it, an autonomous flight. So Alan can wave his arms around. He's not flying. He's not flying it. Uh, <coughs> and I'm rather close to it. Uh, if it goes horribly wrong, then we'll be we'll, we'll fine. So we're just going to stop now, we're not going to fly for too long. Um, we wanted to start this, okay, so if we land it, oh, that would be great. I wanted to start the lecture really, just with a simple demonstration on, on, on a robotic system. And if we want to actually build and deploy these kind of systems in the real world, and it came a bit too close to me there, a bit too quickly. And, uh, and there we go. Just <laughs> switch the drone off. Uh, uh, the other ones. And can we take the battery out of this thing? <laughs> It'll be absolutely fine. Now he's not powered, he's absolutely fine. We want to start with a simple demonstration uh, to give you an idea of the, the kind of robots that we're, we're dealing with. I mean, clearly these are laboratory-based robots. These aren't robots that you would put out in the real world. But what we want to explore, what we're interested in, in the kind of work we're doing uh, in, the, in the two departments, is what happens when uh, we're deploying these robots and things start to go wrong. Because this is going to happen. When we were practicing this, I'll be honest with you, now we've done it, okay? I'll be honest with you, we've had some problems with these robots. They do misbehave themselves. Things break, things go wrong, uh, the robots might fly off in the wrong direction. Uh, we had one yesterday, uh, I can tell you now, actually uh, decided that it was too close to the ground, even at six meters, and still climbing, and hit the roof, and then actually decided to shut off its engines and crash to the floor. So these kind of things happen. So what we're interested in doing is developing systems that can actually cope with that, um, and be able to detect when things go wrong, be able to maybe diagnose what's wrong, and actually do something about it. I actually do that in such a way with uh, there is no central point of control at all. Not every single robot I'll be talking about tonight is, a, is, is part of a swarm system. But what I'm going to explore is this notion of immunity. And immunity is a, a very kind of overloaded term for some people coming from an engineering background. I, I have a certain view of what I think it is. But there are lessons, I'm going to argue, uh, that we can learn from how natural, real immune systems work, right? and how we might be able to translate that across into systems like the I-90 and the drone and, and other land-based robots. But first we need to kind of really explore what it means to have an immune system. Actually, what do I mean by that? And it might not be exactly what you think I mean. So the first thing to talk about is what, what we think immunity might be. So we might intuitively think of an immune system as something that we have inside of our bodies. So we have uh, a, a different uh, immune cells that will react to various infections over time, will start to adapt and change so they can cope with different types of infections. And there are lots of, lots of different kinds of responses that uh, your immune system will elicit in response to various infections. How the immune system does that is fascinating to me from, from an engineering background. I work a lot with experimental immunologists, some of whom are, are here in the audience, um, and some whose videos they will recognize um, that I've shamelessly stolen, but 
I think I did ask, so we're all right. <laughs> uh, but we, so we work a lot with those guys building kind of computational models of immune system, trying to understand how immune system function works, and then actually tra trying to translate that across into, into engineering, uh, in particular today from uh, robotics. So we can think about an immune system just as on an individual level. So we all have our individual immune system, so can we have an immune system in the robot? What would that really mean? Well, it might mean something like, well, the robot can detect when something goes wrong with itself. That's kind of what our own immune system is doing. When we get infected, the immune system recognizes something and makes a response. And we do the same thing there, and we can. You know, we can use that term immunity to mean that. So it will detect when something goes wrong. Maybe one of the components fails, one of the wheels starts failing, some of the sensors start breaking, and so on. But that's not just what immunity is to me at all, right? We can also think of immunity as a collective immunity as well, as a population level type immunity. And if we want to um, make that at a swarm level, so at a swarm level I mean lots and lots of robots, so imagine the demo with seven or eight drones. We've had four running, by the way, and we didn't dare do it in here. Uh, we were nervous of doing one. Uh, but I have a very cool video at the end of more flying robots for you, okay? But we weren't brave enough to try it in here. And you'll see why when you see the demo. <clears throat> so we can also think of it as a collective. But So we've got lots of robots interacting. And again, we can look at maybe natural systems and how they work. So this is a nice video from BBC a few years ago. This is a flock of starlings, I think it is, over Rome. where And some of you would have seen this before. You know, you'll have seen things like this in nature, where birds are flocking. And to us, they make incredibly, I think, really attractive patterns. You look at it, and it's actually kind of beautiful, I think. You know, how do those birds do that? How do, you know, they're not colliding. You don't see many of them kind of falling out of the sky, knocking into each other. You know, they're actually using quite simple rules. To really crudely putting it, yeah, they're, they are kind of they're following. They have a simple rule to follow. They want to stay together. They don't want to bang into each other. Being near the center is actually pretty good because it's less dangerous from predators and so on. So actually, you start to get these kind of um, uh, patterns emerging from very, very simple uh, interactions of individual uh, birds in this case. Can we translate that across to robotics? And indeed we can. And actually we'll show you a few demonstrations of that on the table here and some in simulation. But there's lessons to be learned there from uh, systems like that. And crucially, there's no central control. So in the engineering context in robotics, that means if things start to go wrong, there is no central monitor looking at it observing it, going, that bit's wrong, that bit's wrong. What it means is the swarm of robots has to be able to figure out itself that it's gone wrong and do something about it together and in a distributed way, active way. And there's no central point of control at all. We see other examples of a collective behavior uh, which are useful. And so this is a, a really cool video, I think, uh, from BBC on, on, on ants. And ants to survive, we can think of survival of a, an ant colony as a level of immunity. You know, they want to, they, they're surviving, and they're doing, they're interacting and doing collective things together, things that an individual ant can't do on its own, but they work together. And so, but you'll see these ants are interacting, they're attacking prey, and up, oh, and there he goes, right, and he's gone. But what you, what you are seeing is the ants are interacting together using local communication, very simple rules. They're acting together. And we can translate that across to our artificial systems, engineered systems. But to me, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, there's the immunity in the collective, because they, they need food, they need to replenish, they need to tidy up. Okay? So actually, can we learn lessons there as well? If we're controlling lots of robots, we also need to coordinate them. This is a video, YouTube video of fireflies in nature, natural fireflies. And so they will blink, and actually what they then start to do is that they blink, they're observing other ones, they see other ones, and they, their blinking starts to change. So eventually they all synchronize. So what you've got there, again, is an example of a coordination across a large number of, a large population. Actually, so if we're to build swarm robotic systems and, and stop them going, well, we have to solve this problem as well, engineering, we have to be able to coordinate. Decentralized coordination, again, remember that. It's a theme that's going to run through the whole thing. We're decentralized. So... We could talk about swarm immunity. So actually, the immune system, I can think of it and I can see it very much as a, as a swarm-like system in that 
Our swarm systems, to me, will use, um, have relatively simple behavior, individual ag agents will have relatively simple behaviors, but use usually local communications. They only communicate with things that are close by. So they may change the environment. So one thing that's common to nearly all swarm-like systems is they use something called stigmagy, where effectively they change the environment somehow. And that change in the environment affects the behavior of other agents in that area. So here, this is a simulation from some of the work we do with the CII on, on looking at pious patch formation, which are little kind of lymph, lymphoid tissues that develop in the gut. And what you've, what you've just seen there is a, is a formation of a number of structures. And it's doing that, the immune system does that by having cells that interact with each other and they produce other proteins which then recruit things in and they start to film, form these structures. The cells don't know what they're building. Uh, they don't know what they're building, they're just doing it. Yeah. And these structures emerge from these little kind of interactions between them. So we can think of the immune system as a swarm system itself, because it, it, it fulfills many of the properties that a swarm system will do. And that would be on an individual level. You know, that's the kind of thing that's happening in you all, you know, happening inside of you, your gut. Again, we come back to this idea of survival as a collective. And the fact that, again, ants are a nice example of this, because they, they do do kind of cool things of moving big objects and so on where you have the, the, the immunity in this case means that an in the, the group itself will actually start to will, will survive through cooperation. So it's not just about health and individual protection, making the case actually immunity is more than that case, okay? kind of a population level, it's a spe maybe species level. If we kind of switch for a minute, to an engineering perspective. So let's think more about kind of uh, robots just for a minute. One thing that interests us a, a lot is how to build these systems that operate for long periods of time without any human intervention. It's autonomous, autonomous systems. Where in particular, if we're deploying swarm-like systems, the swarm needs to survive. The robots need to be maybe deployed for days, weeks, even months in some cases, if you're doing, you know, fantasy land for a minute, but if we're doing deep space exploration, you know, we can't nip out and fix it. You know, we can't do that. So we're interested in areas where we're working in very uh, inaccessible areas. This is kind of where this technology could potentially be useful. Now, there's a lot of really good engineering that goes on into building some robots, and some of you will have seen this video before if you're a, a YouTube fan. This is an engine, this is a real robot, this is not two men in a pantomime outfit. Okay. There are YouTube videos of that. Yeah. Google big dog pantomime horse uh, and you get the most hilarious videos. Absolute hours of fun. Yeah. And really we should be working. No, I, I do it my own time, honestly. But big dog is an incredible piece of engineering um, developed by a, a company called Boston Dynamics over in the States. Large amounts of uh, military funding into this but you can see, uh, it's, it's obviously it's quadruped, it's driven by uh, an engine, a, a diesel engine, I think it is on there, right? It's incredibly stable, isn't it? It's amazing, absolutely amazing. You watch this on the ice. Yeah? It really does look like two blokes, doesn't it? And I have to say, it really does, yeah? but it isn't, it seriously isn't, right? Uh, but the engineering effort that's gone into that, into recovery and so on, that's the kind of thing we're interested in building, but actually, you know, we would like large amounts of these, maybe, yeah, to be able to operate together and coordinate them. So we're not, in, you know, we're not building these kind of robots. We're interested in that coordination. What we have down here, Lewis is from the electronics department, and he's working with this little um, he ooh, hexapod. So a six-legged robot. It's not big dog, right? But this is the kind of robot that we would use in the lab to test some of the ideas, particularly in terms of control. So if we get it walking, I'm afraid he is in a very confined space, so he does go over a little bit. So hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, keep him going, actually, Lewis, if we can. So actually, this is a very difficult control problem. You've got six independent legs, you've got 24 independent motors, and you have to coordinate these. So this is actually really tricky. Just getting it to walk actually is hard, yeah? and let alone doing the things that Big Dog was, was demonstrating. Yeah. So there is some kind of very nice kind of engineering stuff that's going on, but actually not that many people look at what happens when uh, things go wrong and they need to do recovery and maybe repair themselves. This is particularly true uh, in the case of swarm-like systems. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Thank you.
we might be you know, trying to build interesting systems like that, but actually building systems that can cooperate and perform tasks that individual robots can't do. So a big dog can walk, big dog can cope with ice, big dog can climb things, it can jump like a horse, it's cool, but if you spend enough money on it, you'll make it do anything you want. Yeah? So, but what we're interested in is looking at trying to coordinate individual ones. So this is an example of a project from uh, Brussels and EPFL at Lausanne. This was a project called Swarmbots. So what they did there is they built specialist robots. That is a live child, by the way, okay? Um, and so what, we're what they're trying to do here and what we're interested in in terms of swarm robotic systems is coordination of behavior. So you'll see the robots are changing colors, and that's a, that's a local communication. That's a change in the environment from the colors. And other robots see that, and then it start, they start to recruit each other because they're pulling on the system, and they can't, they can't move it, so they recruit another one. Yeah, and then they keep recruiting, keep recruiting, until eventually there's enough of them, right? And this is real. Yeah, this is real. And then off we go. <laughs> and then we drag the poor little child across the floor. Right? It's obviously it's an example of collective behaviors yeah, that we're interested in doing. But what you might see on TV, reality, what I'm trying to make a point, is very different to what the media and films make you believe. You know, this is an image from uh, SG-1, which I absolutely love. These are all little robots called replicator robots that can reproduce themselves. If they get blown up, they can rebuild themselves. They can coordinate themselves um, as, a, as a collective. Right? And we can't build anything remotely like this yet. But I think it'd be kind of cool if we could. Not to do things like <laughs> this one does, yeah, in terms of taking over the world and silliness, like that. But actually, the, the, the underlying ideas of the swarm coordination, getting them to do things together without central control, and in terms of the immunity in this way, is actually uh, like a, a steady state operation of the system. So actually, they coordinate if things start to go wrong, like in here, some of them were killed off. They can cope with that. They can keep working. Yeah, and that's kind of what interests me and drives my research out. So what I'm going to show you now is three examples right, of, of different types of immune systems that one can think about in terms of a robotic system. One is on an individual unit, and the other two ideas are related to swarm and what we call organism uh, kind of robots. All will be revealed with some hopefully cool videos. So we're going to look at um, an immune system that I'll argue is we can use to sense and react to external events to the robot. So it's sensing the environment somehow, and it's reacting to that. Because we do that, you know, our body is a bit like that. We're sen we sense the environment through, through, our cell through cells of the immune system, and we make a response. So that's a level of immunity. We can sense and react to events internal to the robot and the swarm. So that's when things start to break. Maybe the power system fails. Um, uh, yeah, maybe the power system fails, maybe uh, wheels start to fail, maybe sensors get stuck and so on, internal to the robot, but also what other robots are doing in the swarm. So actually, can we have an immune system within a robotic system that actually, where robots are monitoring what everyone else is doing and comparing themselves and saying, well, actually, maybe I'm not doing so well yeah, and do something about it. And then react to internal, external events in an organism. And this is where robots can physically join together. Yeah, and that creates a whole load of new problems. Uh, if this wasn't hard enough, you start sticking the things together and making them move together, it becomes even more complicated. So, for the, for the guys who are from immunology, and you have to forgive me for about 30 seconds where I simplify things beyond belief. And I know Mark and Rika will just say to me afterwards, that was wrong, John. <laughs> but for now, it's right. <laughs> so, there's, um, within the immune systems, we have lots of different types of cells that are involved. One cell that's very, very key is something called a T cell. And this is part of your adaptive immune system, so lymphocytes. And what T cells are very good at is, is recognizing things that effectively shouldn't be there. Yeah. And so they will, they will uh, interact with a, a variety of other proteins. And then actually, if what they're sensing is right, they actually elicit a response. They will get activated and start to kind of reproduce, which kicks off a whole immune reaction. And what we did is we spent some time actually modeling this signaling event. So I'm not going to go into the details of the model, but actually what we managed to be able to do is create a quite a sophisticated mathematical model of this activity of T cells and the signaling within T cells. And it's, 
it's a, it's a quite incredible ability to differentiate things, very, very fine differentiation we can model. There's a nice analogy with that uh, in terms of uh, monitoring things in the environment and wanting to sense things in the environment, where <coughs> there are, maybe there are hazardous things in the environment that, that shouldn't be there. Uh, and my, wouldn't it be great if actually we could build a system um, that can actually you know, take, take the air, sample the air, but actually then process that, and actually signal to say, look, guys, something's wrong here. Actually, this, isn't, this isn't quite right. And stick it on a robot. And so actually do all the processing on the robot and have a very important piece of robotic equipment, which is called a flag. Right? And you'll see why the, ro the flag is so important. So we have a project that we're working on and have been working on for some time with DSTL, we were the Defence Systems Technology Laboratory, um, a research arm of the MOD, where we're looking at building kind of automated systems for the identification of, of hazardous substances. Basically, it's, we're looking at roadside bomb detection, where we want to be able to build systems that can reliably uh, find um, things that shouldn't be there. So we've developed an algorithm based on how the T-cell works in terms of the signaling that's very, very good at detecting changes in the environment. So we can, we can train the system up. It can learn, if you like, to, to use that, I'm careful with that word, but effectively it learns uh, what normal is in the environment. So we can train it a little bit, but lots of hazard, lots of horrible stuff there. This case here is uh, WD-40 on the floor, banana skins and so on. What we're trying to detect is, is deep heat. Deep heat is, has lots of chemical properties in it that are very indicative to the kinds of things our guys are interested in, in detecting. And it gives a sufficient difference that it's, it's worthy of note. And so the system, if you're watching it, has amber lights, but now we've got a red light, and actually our system will be able to identify precisely where that deep heat signal is, right, and drop the all-important flag you know, and, and mark that. But what's interesting about this is that we managed to, the, the, the setup that we had here was all set up by DSTL and was pretty awful. There's diesel there, there's oil, there's banana skins, there's crisp packets, there's Mars bars, and all sorts of rubbish. Right? And here we've put some DP up onto the tire. So our little immune system in the robot is, the, is, is taking input from a sensor that's on the front, it's been called a chemical agent monitor, and processing that signal out the back and looking for the, the differences in the environment. And then this is just to show you, it doesn't always drop a flag. This actually is WD-40 sprayed up against the wheel. And it will turn amber because it's strange, but it's not a threat. And so what we've done is this robot has, if you like, a little immune system that's actually very good at taking signals from this um, uh, agent monitor, the chemical agent monitor system, and actually making sure it doesn't always fire. Because that green thing you see there, I'll just pause the video. This green thing here, chemical agent monitor, James will know very well, is, is very unreliable, but costs the best part of 10,000 pounds, I believe, 10, 15 grand. It's military grade, grade kit. Um, it's incredibly unreliable. So that's one example of a little immune system that's sitting there monitoring the environment and actually then reacting to the environment and making an effect on the environment just by simple identification. What would it mean to have an immune system for a swarm of robots? Some of you will have seen this video before. Jenny's just going to set up a little demo for us. Second. So this is time-lapse photography, guys. Okay, this isn't real. Uh, this comes off a project we've been working on for some time called Symbrium, which is an EU project interested in uh, collective and uh, swarm robotic systems. So what we would like to be able to do is build systems that do this, right? Uh, but clearly we can't do that yet. So here we've got systems that can physically join together, um, can communicate with different... Uh, what we call organisms, a robot, so that's different kind of uh, robots that are connected in different shapes, and use different communications to collaborate together to actually achieve a task. So you might think, well, how hard is that? Right? Turns out programming robots to do anything remotely useful is actually quite difficult. Yeah? So we certainly can't do that yet. Yeah? Um, although the European Commission seem to think we will be able to do it by next year, but... I, <laughs> <laughs> It's remarkably difficult. So even simple things um, are, are, are tricky. So this is a little robots in simulation that are just doing a simple task of foraging. And foraging means robots are going out into an environment, collecting certain objects, and bringing it back to a central point. 
and they have to recharge themselves. They have to know when they've been recharged. They have to keep going and do it as efficiently as possible. You look at that and you think, how hard could that be just to do even something simple like that? It's not that easy. This is something called a state diagram that we use a lot to describe <coughs> systems <coughs> and how we implement them. And so here we have six, seven, eight different states and, and different ways of transitioning between these states. So each one of these states is a behavior that the robot would do at any point in time. So you know we could say, well, we're in a void state. So what that means is the robot's kind of moving along and making sure it doesn't bump into anything. Uh, it would be scanning an area, so it's got a camera on the front maybe. Yeah? So it needs to be able to scan and see things. If it detects an object, then actually it has to move towards it. Then if it moves towards it, uh, if moving towards it, we could get the object in the gripper if it's within the range, then it has to change state and do that. Uh, or actually, it's lost it. The camera's a bit useless, which happen, you know, quite often is the case on these things, so it loses it, so it has to go back again. If it's got the object, it will then try and grab it. If it's got it, it then moves to base, so then it's got to navigate back to base. Yeah. So it gets to the base, then it has to deposit the object. If it's done that, it leaves the base, then it does a random walk, and then it does a void again, and it goes round and round, this kind of circle. A little more complicated task we might have is actually keeping a load of robots together. So if I switch to the camera for a minute. So what you can see here um, are robots called epochs. And epochs we use uh, as a kind of a research uh, platform uh, and, and teaching platform for uh, swarm robotics. And these things are worth about 500 pounds a pop. Yeah, so there's actually quite a lot of money's worth on the table. Yeah. So I better not knock into it. So it would be a bit unfortunate. But what this, algorithm, what this robots are doing is, um, hopefully I'm going to leave this running for about 10 minutes. And what you should see, if everything's working OK, is that you'll see at the moment all the robots are congregated on this side of the table. And they're going to move over to this side of the table. The robots are not programmed to move towards that part of the table, but they'll do it. Hopefully, he says very confidently, having just realized he's committed himself to a live experiment in front of 200 plus people. So we'll see. But actually, how do we do that? What's, what's going on there, again, in terms of programming the behavior of these robots? So actually, here's a simulation. So we'll come back to those robots in a minute. If they haven't moved over there, if you see my hand pushing them, <laughs> you just ignore it. Actually, here's a simulation of a slightly different robot, but exactly the same algorithm. And what it's doing is, again, it's, a, it's a quite a simple, it's relatively simple, but the, the behavior is very interesting. So these robots are programmed effectively, and these ones here, these are running exactly the same algorithms, exactly the same. The, the robots are programmed to move forward for a small amount of time. They then, if they ignore the illuminated and shadow thing in that, in that box over there for a minute, but if they're what they will then do is they try and avoid each other. So if they get too close, they will then turn away. And they're detecting that through infrared sensors. They're programmed to do that. They're also programmed to, as they move forward, they have a timer on there. And if they haven't, uh, if they haven't bumped into anything or avoided anything for a certain amount of time, then what they do is they turn around and head back to where they think roughly uh, the center of the, the collective is. And that alone will actually give you what we call aggregation behavior, where the robots actually stick together. They stay together. And if you run that algorithm, pretty much indefinitely, we just, they would just stay together. You then change it slightly and say, well, let's have a beacon, let's say, on the other side, which actually changes one thing in the algorithm. And that one thing is the, what we call the avoidance radius. So that's how close the robots will get to each other. And if they can see it in the illuminated bit, that means they will actually stay a bit further away. And if you noticed, that swarm started over here and ended up over here. Yeah. Now, the robots aren't programmed to do that. And because they've got, they slightly increase their avoid radius, that means they don't get quite as close to each other during that period. And because the robots want to stay together, the other ones kind of follow it. And over time, the net effect is actually to move all the way across to the beacon, even though they're not programmed to do it. And so that's kind of an interesting, what we call emergent behavior within a swarm, where the, the, the outcome, you know, you look, at the, you look at the code, effectively, and you think, it's never going to do that. Why on earth would it actually move towards the beacon? So this is a problem. This is a good thing, and this is a problem. So what it means is, you end up having what we call these emergent behaviors, which actually you might not either expect to see, or if they might not be quite as controllable as you might like. 
So actually, there's a whole load of problems with such systems and controlling them to make sure they actually do what you want them to do. So they make sure that the, the robots don't go off and do something that they shouldn't be doing. And that's where an immune system, if you like to use a the term there, is useful for a swarm of robots. Because actually, maybe what they need to be able to do then is detect when things aren't quite right and then do something about it. So things do go wrong, though, even with this one. So if I run, I won't be running it here on this robot, but if they go wrong, we will fail one of these robots. And the effect of that, we fail a couple of these. In this case, actually, what will happen is the swarm will stagnate. Actually, it will slow down, because actually, this is now acting a bit like an anchor to the swarm, yeah? so they're not able to move as much because they want to be close together. So actually what we need to be able to do is fix that kind of thing. Yeah? So maybe things aren't quite as robust as we might like to think. There is a common misconception when people uh, build swarm systems in particular, because in the natural system, if you take away a few ants, as we saw earlier, actually the collective will survive. Yeah, it manages to cope just fine. And people in, in, in swarm robotics thought this was the case uh, all the time. However, it turns out not to be strictly true. So if you start failing in a, a certain number of robots, then actually the swarm will stop working uh, under certain conditions. So actually, some kind of self-repairing mechanism within the swarm if actually is needed. And so you need this kind of level of immune system at the swarm collective level. So we've been trying to kind of work on this problem for a while and try and do something called collective repair. And we don't have it solved yet, but what we've been looking at are ideas from how immune systems work and seeing whether we can translate that across. So this is imaging from an a, a, a immune system. This is a, something called a granuloma forming. And these structures form when certain cells get infected. Um, they then recruit other cells around, so they form a structure to try and contain the, uh, the infection. And this is a kind of nice analogy with something we want to do in, in this kind of case, where we have um, robots that are failing. The effect of that failure is one that's actually detrimental to the overall swarm. So actually what we want to be able to do is either remove that robot or do some kind of repair on it, and, and so we can fix that and carry on with the swarm, carry on. And actually in the, in the immune system, the granulomas are, are, are a kind of a mechanism to allow that, to contain that, and maybe remove the infection uh, and get rid of it. So what we've done is we can, we can look at systems like that. We can then actually build computer models of such, such things, so this is work we're looking at in terms of uh, the formation, building simulations of uh, things you've just seen earlier, but the early stages of that, so we can start to understand how these structures work and how they're formed, what kind of communication is going on within the cells of the immune system. We can model that. We can then start to abstract that out into an engineering system where, which we can exploit in a swarm of robots. So actually what, you show, what we're showing here is the same algorithm that's running on, on these, and what we saw before, but we're going to fail a, a quite a large number of robots in the system. And the failure we have here is that they've lost power quite dramatically. And so what we need to be able to do is share energy, and they, on robots need to be able to dock, share energy, work out how much energy they need to do, who needs to do it, who can do it, and when they do it, and do it as efficiently as possible. And remember, there's no central control. You know, there's no computer sat there saying, robot one, you do it, robot two, you do it, robot three, you do it. The swarm works it out. And so there's a little bit of communication going on, the robots are kind of barter, if you like, what's going on, and then they form structures, they can share energy, and they can then carry on. So actually what we managed to be able to do is actually repair the swarm for this particular kind of failure mode. <coughs> And if I switch back, there's a rogue robot or two, but actually what you see now is most of them are now over here on this side. Yeah. And so what they've done is they've actually moved roughly from, make sure I can see my hand, from over here, they were all over here, and they've moved gradually over to this side. There's a couple of them still misbehaving over there, but actually they're, they're, they're not, yeah, they're wrong. Rather than. <laughs> <laughs> you just, think, just ignore the outlier effect, yeah? Uh, and so actually, what the robot started to do is move towards this. We'll leave this running for a few more minutes. It'll probably aggregate. We may have started it a bit too far out from the beacon. I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. But it seems to be uh, working just about. Right. So what we might also want to be able to do is build an immune system in a swarm that monitors everyone else. So actually, we can do what we call social monitoring, where 
immune system, uh, robots are looking at the behavior of, and the performance of other robots around them and comparing themselves with how good they're doing with respect to other robots in the area. And actually we can build and we have built systems that can do that. So these robots will communicate with, them, with each other and they compare their performance against what's expected and what other robots are doing in the locality. And from that, they can infer that they are actually potentially failing I and mean, having a comp maybe a component failure of some kind that's stopping them doing the job that they should be doing. But it's inferred from observation, not from detection within. Yeah? So it's detection, it's an external detection. And it's collaborative and it's completely decentralized. So that's another kind of immune system that we might be able to develop, or we can develop, and, and, and look at deploying in a, in a real-world scenario. So what happens then if we have robots now that can actually physically join together? So we've looked at independent robots. Uh, projects we're working on with the European, another uh, EU project we're involved with is called Symbrian. And wouldn't it be cool to build a system like this? And we can do it in simulation. So these are individual units that can physically dock they can share energy, they have a, um, a common communication bus, well, and they can then start to form 3D structures. Yeah? And this thing um, you know, will be able to walk and actually do things that an individual robot obviously wouldn't be able to do. Now, obviously what's important there is um, the robots need to be able to work out how to form a shape. And then what happens though if certain robots start to fail in that shape? So we'll just show you a couple of scenarios running. So, the self-assembly work that you're seeing just here, this was developed by one of the partners on the project uh, from Bristol looking at um, creating shapes. So at the moment, the robots know what they have to produce, but what they do is they work out between themselves, and I won't go through the, the details of how it does it, works out between themselves recruitment strategies to actually construct these shapes. Yeah. So remember, again, there's no central control here at all. Uh, the robots are working out for themselves um, how to form the shape. Now, the problem is that only works in a perfect world. The robots are going to fail. Now, if you fail a robot in an area, that shape is never going to form. It's never going to form. And likewise, if we're, uh, it may well fail as an organism. Once it's connected, yeah, uh, it may well fail again. So now the red one is the failed unit. That's never going to be able to recruit another robot in there. That shape is never going to form. So this organism will never take shape. So actually, the organism needs this notion of an immune system. It needs to be able to detect that this has gone wrong. It needs to be able to get rid of that robot and rebuild itself. And it needs to do it in a distributed way. Again, no central computer telling it uh, it's all gone wrong and it needs to rebuild itself. So, simulation we're going to show you now is uh, work that uh, we've been done uh, recently on the project. This robot suffers a failure. Uh, we've, we've already formed an organism. The failure is detected by neighboring support modules, which then inform um, connected uh, modules that actually there's been a failure. We then split the system into three, in this case, we're into four, where two of the units remove the physically defective robot. Each suborganism, as it's called, assigns itself a score based on what the shape it was in to start with. And what they do is they then communicate with each other to work out who has the best score. Yeah. So they broadcast its score and its unique ID. And when it receives, when each organism receives a message with a higher score, it stops broadcasting. So eventually only one is broadcasting in the end and it knows that it is the highest score, which obviously is going to be the one at the bottom. So that's the one with the, with the best shape. Uh, for a preset period, it stops broadcasting. If we don't detect any organisms with a higher score, yeah, um, the self-assembly process is restarted. So then the other algorithm kicks in again and the, these two um, suborganisms are, are disbanded, yeah, it's disassembled, so they're allowed to come back into swarm mode, and then the whole reassembly can take place again. And this will work no matter where the failure is, particularly in, this, in the organism. So this is an example of a self-repairing organism robot system. And the, the important thing again to emphasize is that the, the organism itself worked out what to do. And obviously, it's following a preset of instructions, but it doesn't know which one is going to fail, when it's going to fail, where it's going to fail. Yeah. But it will fail. We can fail it, and it can rebuild itself. Yeah. In the next three or four weeks, five weeks, we should be getting the actual real robots to uh, implement this system on. So at the moment, this is a simulation system, 
but the real robots now exist, uh, finally, um, and we should be getting hold of those soon so we can actually put that in actual real robotic systems to do the self-assembly. Things get hairy as well if you're underwater. So other things we work on there is uh, underwater swarms project we have, where you've got, uh, you want to maybe look at uh, having swarms to find objects of interest, maybe black box recorders and so on, uh, uh, in hard to reach areas. You want a swarm of robots to be able to go down, locate it, transmit information back up. Um, and what we have here is simulation still of uh, the underwater systems that we're looking at. And we're interested in this project in looking at, again, how to do the failure recovery. So if there's a failure, so if these robots are starting to form a chain all the way up to the surface, and then we start to have failures in those devices, then actually the, the communications are going to be uh, dodgy at best, and it may not be successful, the swarm may disintegrate. So actually we need to identify and recover from that failure, but do so automatically, again, no central control, and do it underwater, where communication is limited and power is limited on the kind of devices that we're building. So again, you know, we need to build these kind of immune systems for underwater robots too. And the similar strategies we've talked about before might apply. I'm going to show off, hopefully, and they're all there. Okay, Phew. Left it running for long enough, right? Um, and, and they're all there. Creating healthy robots and swarms of robots. Initial advances in this area, but we're a long way, really, from really reliable robots and swarms that can operate autonomously for long periods of time and cope with all sorts of failures and cope with them on their own and, and, and repair themselves and, and, and keep working. We make use of insights and immunology. Not everybody does that. Other people have different ways, which actually are very good too. Okay? We look at this particular area to help drive the technology that we're developing. So can a robot have an immune system? Well, yes, it can but it's definitely not the same as what we have. And this is important, it's not the same. It's a different kind of immune system. You know, robots don't have the same chemistry as us for a start. You know? It's all very, very different. And so hopefully what I've managed to show you, or at least give some insight into, is that robots have different types of immune systems from sensing things and reacting, but also what kind of immune system we might have at a collective level, where robots can detect within a swarm when things are going wrong, and actually do something about it, actually repair themselves and carry on working. Lots of people have helped today. Um, there's been an awful lot of work going on today. We've had a press event today, we've been busy with press, and all these guys you see photographed there have been helping one way or another, working very, very, very hard. Certainly appropriate to acknowledge different uh, fundings and different people we work with uh, throughout the university and externally to the university as well. And my final slide for your entertainment is this. Thank you. David Bowen of IBM. Hi there. Uh, I develop grid software stuff, uh, similar sort of problems that I encounter. One of the things that's interesting to me, we talked about simulation and how effective that is at trying to establish those algorithms and then putting that into real objects and having sensors. Uh, which seems like just a, a, a trivial next step in as much as it's just mm. a question of gathering the data that feeds those algorithms. Mm. How much have you found that actually when you go to physical manifestations that it's a different world to what you found in the simulations? It's a whole different world. Yeah, I think that's the first thing to say and be very honest about that. There's only so much you can do in simulation. When you can calibrate the simulations, we can gather data from sensors and so on, put that into the simulations. At the end of the day, the simulation takes you so far because ultimately you can't simulate the whole world, which is really what you need to do. Of course, you can't. Any simulation is an abstraction of reality. And so, but this, this so-called reality gap, 
it's called in robotics, between the simulation and, and, and reality. The, the way to kind of handle that and the way we try and do it is, so co-develop the systems. So you do some in software, then translate it across to hardware, and then see how that works, see what lessons you learn. You maybe update the simulator as well uh, to take that into account. And that goes some way to bridging that gap. But actually, it is, it is a real problem. It is a real problem. And, there, and so when you, it's, it is a fantasy land to think that actually I can just develop it once in, in simulation and it's automatically going to work. Almost guaranteed it won't. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Mason, uh, self-employed uh, electrical um, engineering consultant. Um, one of the guiding principles of uh, designing critical systems is inbuilt redundancy. Um, and that can and resiliency in critical systems can be achieved with fairly dumb, you know, yeah. unintelligent uh, yes. uh, systems. Is it still a uh, presumably still a fundamental part of the, uh, the design of uh, these systems? Is that there, ha that there has to be a, a lot of redundancy in there, and it, it's a, a, a case of making the best use of what's left after part of that redundancy has right. gone, yeah. rather, rather than. Uh, the, yeah, the, the rather. absolutely. So the kind of work that we're interested in isn't a replacement for all all of that at all. Yeah, because you need you need all of that. What we're <coughs> the the redundancy in like a swarm system, for example. Yeah, where you have you know maybe fifty or hundred of these robots. Yeah, certain swarm. What we have found is that obviously you can do a lot with the engineering on the individual robots to cope with certain kinds of failure and do recovery mechanisms on board and so on. So this kind of work is one step above that, is where that's kind of failed. That hasn't worked. Yeah. And you need an alternative, you need something else on, on top of that. And within, there is, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, there is this kind of assumption in particularly swarm robotics work that the more robots you chuck at it, the more redundant the system is. Yeah. Actually, it's not true, not necessarily true. Yeah. Because they, it's been clearly shown that this algorithm I showed you here and the simulation of it does break. Actually, if you fail enough units, um, there's, a, there's an interesting relationship between the failure rate and the size of the swarm and what it can cope with. And eventually, the whole thing will stop working. Because people have looked at natural systems, you know, I did this years ago as well. You look at it and you go, oh, that's really cool. I want one of those. I want what the ant system does. I want what the brain does. Yeah, and we have this. Which reality in engineering is not like that, you know, because a lot of things don't translate across, which is why when we do a lot of this work, we, we try and do the modeling work first. Because for us, that's really important. And understanding the logic of what's going on, the logical principles within the natural system, and we can get that from the modeling work. And we can then abstract that into relatively sound, I like to think, engineering principles, which we can then put in these systems to the recovery. Because it's not an automatic given that just because it works over there in biology, it's going to work in the natural system. Yeah. And inherent redundancy gets you so far in a swarm system, but it doesn't solve the problem. Alistair Edwards from Computer Science. Um, you're talking about emergent behavior. Uh, so while the, the rules might be quite simple and, and you, you can look at those, is it, is it possible to analyze and predict what the emergent behavior is going, is going to be or do you just have to let it go and with possible unexpected consequences? I yeah, I think, I think it's more of the latter. Yeah. Um, and so I think we need to be able to analyze these systems a lot better than we can at the moment. I mean, clearly we can analyze them to some degree. Yeah, and we can model them. And so actually there are models of the algorithms that I've shown you today. Actually, there are kind of mathematical models that try and describe that behavior. Um, but of course, it's fine to have that in a model, but actually when you've actually put this on a physical device, your models have made all sorts of assumptions about the environment that it's working in. It comes back to the earlier question to do with simulation and the reality gap. So the assumptions you've made in your mathematical models to analyze it actually may not hold on the real physical system. You know, because the sensors behave differently. There's a carpet where there used to be a shiny floor. And so the motors turn at a different speed. There's more friction. And so all those kind of things make it a nightmare to analyze. Very not, it's not easy to analyze theoretically at all. It's very difficult. But then it's even harder when you go to us. And so there are going to be uh, kind of what you might coin as unexpected things that happen. And, and, so, and coping with that is where these kind of ideas might come in. So you start to, you know, you, you say, well, the robots aren't doing exactly what it should be doing, what we think it is doing. Can we do some kind of recovery from it? It's a real problem. It's a real problem.